Amen and amen. Go ahead and grab your seat. Wow, man, what a great morning already. If you have your Bible, open them up to James 5. You've got one more Sunday to hear that, and then we'll move on. Uh, But uh, James chapter 5 will be there in just a few minutes. Uh, You guys remember when you were kiddos and uh, you were in elementary school and your teacher would leave the room for a second. Now, I know that that's not common nowadays for some reason. My wife teaching and all that stuff, she's like, that doesn't happen. But no, it happened when I was a kid. And what did every teacher, what did every kid want to do as soon as that teacher would leave? What's that? Freedom, <laughs> freedom, man. And so uh, the, uh, you have all this pent up energy and all this pent up excitement. And so you wanted to, I don't know, go maybe talk to your friend over in the corner. You wanted to make one of those trash balls and see how many times you could make it in the basket. And uh, there was just lots of conversation and talking and it was chaos. But listen, the freedom was only contingent upon the success of one particular position. You had to have this position in order for you to experience that when the teacher broke free. It was the lookout. You had to have the lookout. You had to have that guy or that girl that was peeking over through the glass just watching to see if the teacher was coming and you could then, while he or she was looking and watching, the chaos would ensue behind and then they would say, she's coming, she's coming, and then what would everybody do? They'd run back over to their desk and they would just sit there and they'd sit like they were doing everything they were supposed to do the entire time the teacher was gone. Anybody ever have that experience before? Know what I'm talking about? Totally, me too. So in a sense, isn't that exactly what we've been talking about? Isn't that exactly what we even talked about last week? That's Jesus has left. He's the teacher. And so now life gets a little chaotic and we're in that waiting between he left and he's coming and what do we do? And life feels like it's stressful, it's chaotic, there's tension. And we've learned that they're in that space between. There's all this waiting that happens. And then you've got these little seasons of waiting that you're walking through as a family or as an individual and in relationships and all kinds of stuff there's all this waiting and it just seems to me that life is really about waiting and there's these pressure points that we're all under and so we learned last week how to wait well do you remember that we learned how to wait well part one point one sub point one now we're going to (laughs) finish the rest so let's get a runway uh, for where we started last week in James chapter seven chapter seven there is no chapter seven just for the record James five uh, in verse seven let's get a runway and figure out what some ground we covered in case you missed it last week he said be patient therefore brothers until the coming of the Lord See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient, he says, to establish your hearts or strengthen, we studied, your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble, here's the new content, verse nine. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You heard of the steadfastness of Job and you have seen the purpose of the Lord and how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no so that you may not fall under condemnation. So we've been answering this question, how do we wait well? Brief recap, our first thought was that we have to learn how to practice patience. And we practice patience specifically in our circumstances. And then we're picking up today, there's another area that James wants us to practice our patience. It's not just in the circumstances that we find ourselves in life, but we practice patience. Look at your neighbor, look at your other neighbor. That's who you're practicing patience with right there. You practice patience with your people. I see that, your your husbands and wives looking at each other, I get it. Uh, But we practice patience with people. How many of you know that's not easy, right? Like, yeah, oh yeah, you're raising the hand, like you're ready, I get it. Yeah, being patient with people, being patient with me, me being patient with you, just relationships, it's, it's not easy. Um, And so James understands that. He tells us in verse nine, look at that phrase, three words, do not grumble. Everybody say, do not grumble. You should totally underline that in your Bible. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that, here's the why, so that you may not be judged because the judge is standing at the door. Now, this doesn't seem to make sense. 
Like, because he's just talking about being patient and uh, it doesn't seem to make sense that he would say, hey, don't, don't get angry. Don't complain against your brother. That's what grumble means, don't complain. Um, and so uh, don't have that kind of attitude and he's, it doesn't fit. But really, if you think about it for a second, you're like, oh yeah, that totally actually does fit. Because think about your life. So when you're stressed and the pressure is coming on you and you're getting squeezed and the, it's weighty and it feels heavy in your life, that pressure's got to vent somewhere, doesn't it? You've got to offload that pressure somewhere. And how many of us know that oftentimes that pressure gets offloaded onto our spouse or onto our children or onto people that we love? I, I don't know why we're that way, but that's just the way that we are as human beings that we just kind of vent that pressure off onto other people. You had a tough day at work and you had a meeting at 4.30 that went till 5.30 and you wanted to leave at five and so on your drive home, you're frustrated about that and then you get stuck in traffic at a light that seems to forever be red and you know, you're now deciding, I think I'm just gonna gun it because I need to get home. Even if it's red, I don't even care. And you feel that tension and then when you walk home, your kids aren't listening, dinner's not ready, not that it has to be ready when you get home, I don't know why I just said that, but I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I just exposed myself for just a second. So <laughs> I don't live in that paradigm, just so you know. Like, yeah, reservations are, thank you. Yeah, I, I don't know how you recover from this. Anyway, you vent on your kids, right? You offload on your spouse. Not that that's fair. Uh, maybe maybe you, your marriage is not going great. And so then you just assume everybody's marriage isn't going great. And so then you just throw shade on everybody all the time, all the time. Uh, maybe money's tight and so you're freaking out and then your wife goes and buys bread and you're like, why are you buying bread? Well, I mean, come on, really? You know what I mean? Like I, that's where we're at. And we just offload that onto other people. And uh, James is saying like, I get it. Like the pressures of life, we, we do that. And so uh, he's saying like, bite your tongue, man. Like, like, and so for many of us, what we'll do is we'll start practicing that. Like with our families and with our, at work and in relationships, we'll just start biting our tongue, right? Okay, so I'm not gonna grumble. And, and I'm, uh, even though life is hard and the, the tension is there and the pressure is heavy. And instead of offloading on someone else, uh, I'll just bite my tongue. That's a bad plan. That's a bad plan. Because really the other side of this isn't just that I'm gonna choose to not say something, it's also like the casual eye roll. It's also the shaking of the head in the meeting like you're such an idiot, really? And James is also saying it's not just what you say but it's your, it's your body language that communicates this grumbling towards other people and James is gonna say to you and to me, don't do that, like just flat out don't do it. And here's the thing, why? Why don't we do that? Here's why. A complaining attitude is a roadblock to you patiently waiting. Like that's flat out, like it's just a roadblock. That complaining attitude is gonna get you nowhere and it's gonna make that endurance that much longer. It's just gonna feel even longer. The pressure is gonna feel even heavier. And so that complaining attitude, it's a roadblock in practicing patience with people. So instead of grumbling, what would James want you and me to do? Instead of complaining, there's a, a something else there and we gotta go to Paul who writes uh, to these people in Thessalonica. He says, we urge you brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Then he says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing and give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And so the antidote to our attitude of grumbling and complaining is really to be encouraging, is to come alongside a brother or sister and put your arm around them and pray with them, encourage them. And you and I would probably be far less critical if we were far better at praying for one another and linking arms with one another. See, I don't want your waiting to go longer than it has to. And if we embrace grumbling, sometimes the waiting goes longer than it has to. And so how do we wait well? We, um, 
practice patience in our circumstances and with people. And then we also, check out this play on words. Uh, This is about as good as I could do. Uh, But we also have to wait well by, check this, putting patience into practice. You're like, I think you just said the same thing. You just changed an article. Like you just changed one little word. I didn't actually say the same thing. Point number one was practice patience. And then the second point is put patience into practice. So it's the command, now it's the application. James is telling you like there are real people who've actually done this. Like you've got to flesh this thing out. You've got to put this thing into 3D real time, 4K right there in your life. And look at what he says in verse 10. He actually says this. He says, as an example, circle that word, I'll come to it in a second. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You've heard the steadfastness of Job and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. James carefully uses this word example. This is so important. It's actually a super, super awesome and beautiful word. James is gonna show us how to put this patience into practice by this specific word, example. In their culture, in the Bible, they had uh, these students who would wanna learn how to write their letters. And in the ancient language, their letters were like artwork almost. And so they would put these letters into books, bind these books together, and they would be at a church or in a particular library, and they'd go pull that book off the shelf, and then they would pull that letter up, and it would just be right all over this page. And a student who would wanna learn how to draw that letter correctly would grab a piece of thin tracing paper and lay that over the top of that letter and then they would practice tracing that letter and learning the intricacies of that particular ancient language and that letter and they would learn how to draw that letter correctly over time, routinely over and over and over again by tracing that letter in that book. And that's what that word example means. And what James is saying is is there are people who've gone before you and I want you to trace their lives, follow their lives as examples and routinely come back to them and learn how to carefully craft your life like theirs and learn from their lessons, learn from where they failed, learn from where they succeeded and draw out those principles, trace them over your life so that you can learn how to put this patience into practice. And he gives us great examples. He first calls out in verse nine, the prophets. Look at what he says, or verse 10. He says, as an example, trace over their lives, take the prophets. What did they do? They spoke in the name of the Lord. The prophets are an example for you and for me to follow, to trace as an example for our lives. Now, I already see some of you glossing over. You're like, okay, so what? It's because you're not a Jew. It's no big deal. The Jewish readers of this original passage would have been like, dude, I'm there. I got it. I know exactly what you're talking about, who you're talking about, because it's our history, and and I know that. And so we've got to do a little digging to figure out who these prophets were and who was James talking about. And scholars are divided on who it was, so let's not just, you know, split horse hairs. But it could be, it could be Hebrews chapter 11, where he talks about you are, uh, you know, all of the by faith people, Abraham, Jacob. You go back through our history and go, all these people who were examples of great faith in our lives, maybe it was them. And to which I would say, sure, that could be it. Totally could be it. I don't have time to go through all those. I actually charted all that out. We would be in part three and I'm not gonna do that to you. Uh, But there are many examples that it could be, but I'm just gonna draw out a couple for you so that you can trace their life. First, just notice what the passage says. Just start there with these prophets. What was the charge against them? Why did they suffer? Why did they have to remain steadfast? Because they spoke. They were faithful. They spoke in the name of the Lord. They preached and they did exactly what God called them to and they suffered for it. Now this doesn't sell great books and doesn't fill auditoriums, but what I'll tell you is when you and I faithfully follow Christ, it doesn't always mean that you get a raise. It doesn't always mean that everything works out great. It doesn't mean that you take the yellow brick road to the Emerald City and you get everything you'd wished for and hoped for. It doesn't mean that it's automatic. And I don't know where the notion has come from in our faith that that's how it is following Christ. But what it does mean is if you do get thrown under the fire, there's someone there with you. That's what it means. 
It means that even being faithful and obedient to what God's called you to, even if it gets worse before it gets better, if God pulled you into that moment and called you to that task, he will equip you and gift you and give you the grace you need in that moment to do everything he's called you to do, to sustain, to be patient, to be steadfast, and to endure. I love knowing that even if it gets difficult, God gives you and me what we need, the strength that we need to make it through that next season. I think about the prophet Elijah. Elijah is such a, I mean, dude, that guy's insane. Like, I mean, he's just ridiculous with his faith. He goes to King Ahab and he tells him, it's not gonna rain for three and a half years. Now, for many of us, we're like, that's awesome. I, I'm down with that. But imagine what would happen if you didn't have rain for three and a half years. Joy just hosted this cafe party for the people who serve in the cafe and I made my salsa. Sorry, some of you, if you want my salsa, you gotta serve in the cafe. But I uh, made some salsa and I was just thinking about this this week that uh, no rain for three and a half years. There's no tomatoes. There's no onions, no cilantro. There's nothing, like, you, like listen, Beef gets limited to, for tacos. Dairy goes down. Like think about the fallout of not rain, no rain. Food supply diminishes and people get in fist fights for a loaf of bread. That seems pretty traumatic for a group of people to walk through. And, and uh, Elijah says it's happening for three and a half years. And what's interesting is you would think that God would pull him out of that situation, Right? And because he's his prophet and he's being the truth teller and bringing the truth to bear on the hearts of the people. But what's interesting is, is that Elijah gave the truth of the situation and was not exempt from the situation. That he had to endure it too. For three and a half years, he had to endure it. And what I love about it in a lesson we can learn is that God cares for us in the suffering when we do his will. Because it was in that season of three and a half years that the showdown on Mount Carmel happened where the prophets of Baal came, there were hundreds of them up there. And I'll, well, I'm gonna actually preach about this in a couple of weeks, but um, there, I mean, it is insane what happens on top of this mountain. And fire falls and God, I mean, the, 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 the Baal prophet is destroyed and the showdown on Mount Carmel happens and God provides triumph and victory in the most scarce, scarcity moments of their lives, in the most deepest amount of national suffering that a nation had ever suffered, God gave a season of triumph on Mount Carmel. God cares for you and for me, even in the midst of intense suffering. I love what Warren Wearsby says. This will be a great spot for an amen, so I'm priming the pump just a little bit. He says, uh, the will of God will never lead you where the grace of God cannot keep you. The will of God will never lead you where the grace of God can't keep you. It's enduring grace day in and day out. Another prophet that comes to mind is Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah gets, Jeremiah gets a bad rap because they call him the wailing prophet. You know what that means in our language today? He's a whiner. He just whined a lot. But you'd whine too if nobody ever came to faith in Christ your entire ministry. You just preach and preach and preach and the people turn you off and turn you off and turn you off and nobody hears and nobody hears and nobody applies, nobody does anything. Like that's a recipe for depression, which is what he walked through. It was tough. Even his own, like his own church people like attacked him. The king threw him into prison, threw him in a well, at the bottom of a well to die. And this young man just stayed there to die. And what's interesting is he's in, even in his suffering, you know what happened? Two things. Number one, God fed him and God protected him because it was at that time that Jerusalem was being sieged and God saved him and spared him. It's what the prophet Isaiah wrote. Check this, this is awesome. Uh, that um, I'm getting ahead of myself, so I'm not, I'll tell you Isaiah in a minute. So I just wanna just say this. God sees you today. God loves you. And if you're in the pit, if you're in the waiting, you're not alone. God cares for you. And I know it stinks. I know that there are nights where tears fall on your pillow and there's a pool right there and you don't know what to do. I get it. And more than me tell you this, let the Spirit of God speak to you through his word by the example of these men who have gone before you that he is faithful and he is true and he will provide sustaining grace for you 
in this dark season of waiting. But why do we have to endure? There's a ton of reasons why, and I just want to tell you this. The reason that we have to endure, twofold. Number one, God wants you to press into him. You want to know why these things happen to us? The reason these things happen to us is because God, you need Jesus. Like you need to just say that in your own heart today, not out loud, but just say, like I need him. Now I get it because a lot of us have a lot of stuff. And so it's easy in our culture today to have a lot of stuff and to feel like we're good. Like I, I'm good, I don't, I don't need God. Like you need him. Because if it was all wiped away tomorrow, oh, you would need him. So don't wait for it to be wiped away. Lean and press into him today. The other thing is, is that by your example of pressing into the Lord, you have a people in your sphere of influence that I don't have that are watching you and watching me and watching us in this season of waiting and you're showing them just how legit Jesus really is. You're showing them just how faithful and true he really is. You're showing him just how gracious and loving and kind and merciful he really is in the season of waiting and you're really making this whole thing called Christianity look extremely attractive and extremely beautiful to a world who is desperate and in need of something that sustains, that's something that lasts because when the world crumbles, the only thing left is Christ and Christ alone. And so when we endure well and press in to Jesus in the waiting, you're drawing people. It's evangelism, you guys. You're drawing people to Christ by the way that we wait. He gives us another example, the prophets, and then he talks to us about Job. You heard about Job before? Listen to what the text says in verse 11. He says, behold, we consider those who are blessed, uh, those blessed who remain steadfast. Like there's a reward, guys, on the other side of this. Like there's a favor, there's blessing, there's inheritance, if you will, on the other side of steadfastness, of patient endurance, of enduring well. He says, you've heard of the steadfastness of Job and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Job had it all, y'all. He had everything. He had the estate, the servants. He had the wealth. He had everything he could, you could ever imagine. A great family, a marriage. Friends, reputation. He had it all. And then his spiritual enemy got permission from our heavenly father to go after him. And God said, you just can't kill him. You can do anything you want to him, but you can't kill him. And so he went after everything he had. He went after his home, smithereens. He destroyed his entire family. His friends said, you must have a lot of sin in your life because all this stuff is happening. You should totally walk away from the Lord. And he never did. Even his wife turned his back on him and said, you should curse God and die. You should kill yourself. That's how bad this is. And in a season, a period of a few weeks, just all this stuff, people, things, dropping like flies. Everything that he had had, gone. Gone, everything he had worked for in his life was gone. And I get it, because I think if that happened to you and me, we'd feel the tension, man, I'm throwing in the towel, this, I'm done. I could just drive my truck straight through that telephone pole right now and it'd all be over. And I get that feeling when you feel like there's no hope and there's nothing left to hope for. But there's some encouragement in the life of Job if you know the story. William Barclay helps us feel inspired by uh, Job when he says this, the very greatness of Job lies in the fact that in spite of everything which tore at his heart, the loss of his children, the loss of his friendships, the loss of all the stuff that he worked hard for his entire life, all of that, it tore at his heart. He never lost his grip on faith and his grip on God. The flame of his faith was never extinguished. Come what may, no matter what you take away, God must have a plan in this. There must be a reason why this is happening. And I don't have the lenses to see through eternity past and eternity future the reason why all of this is happening. And he didn't know that all this stuff that, that, that the devil had for him and the plan that he had for them, he didn't understand all of that. And he said, I don't know what's happening right now, but I'm never going to let go of God. And I'm never going to let go of my faith. And it's essentially, he's a Applying the New Testament principle Paul wrote about where he said, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in me will complete that work on the day of Christ Jesus. Like he's not leaving me here by myself. Like this must not be the end of the story. 
And it's not the end of the story if you know Job's story. Job suffered and waited and waited and waited, lost his health, lost his wealth, lost everything that he'd ever had. And the scripture tells us, James says, and insisted that we had seen, there's that verse in verse 10, that phrase, seen the purpose of the Lord. What's the purpose in that? Like what's the purpose in Job losing everything? Why in the world would God allow that to happen? What was it? Here's the purpose. At the end of it all, through all the waiting, through all the patient endurance, through all the suffering, through all of this stuff, Job 42, five tells us this. I've heard of you. Like I'd heard what you've done for all those other people. I heard about you as the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I've heard the deliverance from the, uh, from the Egyptians. I heard about the parting of the Red Sea. I heard about God providing bread from heaven. I heard about all the stuff that you had done throughout the ages. I've heard of all that stuff. And it's, how many of y'all know it's one thing to hear of something, it's another thing to experience something. And that's what Job is saying is I've heard of all this, but what does the next part of the verse says? But now my eyes see you, I see you, but now, some of you need a but now moment today. Like right now, you've walking through all this stuff and I've heard about the great deliverance from somebody from this addiction or somebody that you know was waiting and waiting and waiting for their marriage to have a breakthrough and then they had a breakthrough and then you're thinking, not me, not me, it's passing over my house, it's passing over my family, it's passing over everything I've ever wanted and listen, you've heard about what the Lord has done in other people's lives but now you need an encounter and your eyes need to see the Lord. See, everything changes when you see Jesus and that's what happened with Job. In other words, what Job is saying is, is I've heard, but now I see, I see that you are faithful and true. I see that you're working in all of those circumstances and I see that you couldn't do in my heart what you did in my heart any other way. It had to happen in this way. It had to happen through these set of circumstances, through this lot in life. It had to happen that way and now I see you as a compassionate father who is tender and mercy and I wouldn't know you as a compassionate, tender, and merciful father if I hadn't walked through a season where I needed your compassion and I needed your mercy. But now my eyes see you. I see you now. I see you. On the other side of him seeing the Lord, it was right there where the Lord restored his friendships, his family, and his fortune. Y'all, he lived another 140 years. He had another lifetime after his season of waiting. How many of us know that often what happens on the other side of waiting are life's best things? On the other side of your waiting is God's promise. There is fulfillment. That's what, ha- that's what fulfillment means is there's waiting, there's waiting, there's waiting, and then boom, fulfillment. That means you had a season of waiting, the promise is on the other side. And he lived another 140 years, saw four generations of little Job clan running through the land. Some would say it was over, but it was not over. It actually had just begun for him and for his life. And somebody needs to hear that today in this room, that it's not over. It's not over for you. It's not over. You got a little dot, dot, dot at the end of your sentence. That means there's more to come. This is to be continued. This is to be determined. Your faith needs strengthened. Your heart needs to press into the Lord. And you need to rely on him as faithful and true, compassionate and merciful in your life. And even if it doesn't get better today, we all know from last week that it does get better in the end. What we need to do is trace the life of Job and put into practice patiently enduring, being faithful to the end. The Lord has not forgotten. The Lord has not forgotten. Now, the prophet Isaiah says this. I will not forget you, says the Lord. I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. God can't forget you. Your name is written on his hand. Your situation has got a title. And it's got an end and he knows. And he's holding your very life in the palms of his hands. Will you trust him with that? You see, so much of patiently enduring and putting patience into practice is trusting just how really big God actually is and how much in control he really actually is. And we just have to let go and let him do it. There's a part that we have to play in all of this, y'all. 
yes, put that patience into practice, but there's another element of, yes, let's look at the prophets. Let's trace our lives with that. Yes, let's trace our lives with Job. But I would contend that somebody's tracing your life today. Did you hear me? Somebody's got a sheet of paper and they're watching your every move. They're probably about four foot tall. They live in your home, sleep and eat your food. My best guess is it might not be my kid, necessarily my kids that are tracing my life. My best guess is some of my, my children, my Swenson kids are tracing your lives. They're watching you. Some of these students over here, they're watching you. The people in your neighborhood are watching you. And they're tracing us and they're watching what we're doing and when we feel pressed and we feel crushed, they're, they're watching us. And again, it feels awkward when James goes to verse 12, but it's not awkward. Listen to what is important to what James is saying. He says, but above all, my brothers, don't swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Awesome, that feels out of place. It's not out of place. Because how many of us know that when the pressure's on, it's really quick to lie? When the pressure's on, it's really quick to fuss. It's really quick to fib, and we're really quick to cuss. Preacher, you better stop meddling. Well, I'm sorry, but I've been meddling all week here. When the pressure's on, what we're called to is radical truth. That's what James is saying. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. That's what he's getting at. He's saying, listen, people are watching you. People are watching me. They're watching us and they're watching how we're enduring. And that feels like a lot of pressure. It's only a lot of pressure if you're doing it in your own strength. It's not a lot of pressure if you're pressing into the Lord and you're living out the Holy Spirit's power in your life. If you're living that out, then it's really just being obedient to what God's called us to in his word. And we're to be a people who stand on the truth. We're to be a people to, who speak radical truth and who bring radical truth to our situation. That's why I can say with passion that this isn't the end of your story because radical truth is that Jesus is reconciling all things to himself and Revelation tells us that behold, I am making all things new and one day everything you see will be not as it is but it will be brand new as God intended. And he's making all things new with you in mind and me in mind. And we've got to bring that kind of truth and speak that kind of truth over our lives, not some positive mumbo jumbo Dr. Phil junk. I'm talking about real Bible truth to our soul. Because that's what stirs your heart towards Christ. And I know we might get encouragement by some article that we read on Facebook by some person we'll never know. But you better check that at the door if you want to live a sustaining life this side of heaven. Maybe log more hours in this. Get your screen time here, not your screen time from here on your phone. Because you build your life on this truth, this is the rock that when the winds come and the waves crash in, the fire gets hot, guess what will stand forever? The word of God. The word of God, will everything will pass away, the Bible tells us. But the one thing that will stand forever, there is one thing you're taking to heaven with you. It's the word of God that you've hidden in your heart. How powerful is it gonna be when you've lived this word out for 80 years and then you see the living word right before you. So you gotta bring radical, just like I do, radical truth because people are tracing our lives. Do you know there's a reward and a promise attached to building our lives around this truth? Jesus even said it in John chapter eight. He said, if you abide in my word, by the way, his word is truth, and you are truly my disciples, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Radical truth brings freedom. You want freedom today? Do you want the chains to break? 
Do you want to not feel the singe of fire like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do you not want to feel the waves crashing around you like the apostles did on the Sea of Galilee when they thought Jesus was a ghost walking to them on the water? Know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Build your life on this book, and you'll be free. I'm not saying that it's going to be cupcakes and rainbows, but I'm saying the radical truth brings an expression of freedom in your life, even when everybody looks at you and goes, dude, I don't know how you're making through it. I don't know how you are. We, we've got uh, somebody that we are connected with that their child is going through an intense, like, bone disease. And I'm sitting here thinking, how in the world are they making it through that? If one of my kids were suffering through that, that, that would rock me to the core. How many of you would say that would rock me to the core? Absolutely it would. And the only way you can make it through that, by the sustaining grace of Jesus Christ, your life being built upon the truth of this word, knowing that he is faithful and true. So every year, there's a massive competition in Hawaii called the Ironman Triathlon. The Ironman Triathlon is the greatest test of human, it, it pushes the human body to limits that are unexplainable. This race will take you all day. All day. The first part of the race starts off on the beach, which I'm all for. But what's about to happen, I'm not necessarily all for. A 2.4 mile grueling open water swim. That is not my home. That is the home of sharks and whales and jellyfish. Stories are told that in the grueling 2.4 mile swim in the Ironman triathlon, there are men and women that are scraping and clawing at the contestant or the athlete in front of them, grabbing their legs and pulling them back so that they could get a leg up on them, one more body length in front of them. I'm talking biting, screaming, shoving, pushing, because there's a prize at the end. Now, at the end of the 2.4 mile swim, they run up onto the shore and yeah, that would be enough for me. But now there is a 112 mile grueling ride on your bike through the Kona coast. Traveling through old volcano, solidified volcano uh, uh, areas. I don't even know what those things are called, but parks, I guess and just pedaling and grinding and grinding all the while your shoulders are on fire because you've just swam freestyle for almost two and a half miles. Now your calves are pumping, your quads have, are sore and you, you can't get enough Gatorade. I mean, just give me the IV and you can't get enough. Your endorphins are now starting to fall. Your electrolytes are low. You're needing some sustenance. And if that wasn't enough, by the time that's done, you pull your bike over into a rack and then you strap on your running shoes and run a 26.2 mile marathon. To which for some people, that takes them all day to do that. And now you're running an insane route through the hills of Hawaii with the humidity creeping on your back the entire way. With every step, with every pedal, with every stroke, these athletes are being pushed to the limits of their own body. Pushing through the pain, pushing through the discomfort, embracing this unfamiliar, I've never felt this feeling before. And as I thought about these triathletes, what's interesting is, is that the winner of that race is touted as the most strongest, the most effective, and the best endurance athlete in the world because they've been tested in every way. Loved ones, is that not what we have been talking about for two Sundays. That is our life. The endurance race of your life with every step, with every stroke, with every 
pedal with every single moment to grind and grind and grind, not in your own strength, but in the strength that God gives you through the power of the Holy Spirit. We kick, we breathe, we pedal, we take it step, one single step at a time, and we stand and we move and we lean in and we press in to the very end, no matter what it takes. And it's what Paul said to the Corinthian believers, do you not realize that in a race everyone runs but only one gets the prize? Everybody runs but only one person's actually going to win. And he says, run to win. There's no race I wanna enter in that I don't have a shot in winning. And he's saying, I want you to run this race to win. Verse 25 says, all athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I've been waiting two weeks to tell you this, that when you patiently endure and you wait well, you are running the race of life one step at a time. That step is on purpose. That step is on purpose. Don't waste a step when you're running a grueling race. Don't waste one single step because you've got to encapsulate every amount of energy that you have to stay faithful to the calling with with which God has called you to. Don't waste your step. Don't waste your step. The way we don't waste our step is by practicing patience in our circumstances and with people and putting that faith into practice by tracing the lives of those people who have gone before us and faithfully following Jesus to the end so that on your very last breath the thing that can be said about you and me no matter what you have or what you don't have he was faithful to the end she was faithful to the end life threw them all kinds of hiccups but they were faithful to the end and they pressed into the Lord no matter what